Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dogs and cats, children and babies, in the words of the immortal Manny Fresh, welcome to the Driveline Academy podcast, the world's most dangerous youth baseball podcast. I'm your host, Devin Morgan, director of baseball at Driveline, founder of the Driveline Academy. Uh, why are we the most dangerous youth baseball podcast? Because we talk about stuff that I think is sometimes going to cause a certain amount of dissent or discussion, or it might be challenging to your ideas of what you believe to be true. It's challenging to my ideas of what I believe to be true. Um, man, I feel like I'm, I'm starting a little hot on you guys because uh, it's been a morning, um, but I'm just going to, uh, in this moment, reflect how much I love my life. I love my wife. I love my children. I love my job. Um, and I love the fact that you guys are here and I get the chance to just sit down and like talk about youth baseball with you. So we're going to woosaw our way through this moment and get back to the way that we normally do this thing. So housekeeping as per usual, axbat.com code DL20 is going to get you 20% off of whatever you want to buy on axbat.com. Um, D as in dingus, L as in loser, two zero, dingus loser, two zero. That should be easy to remember. Get yourself 20% off. Um, what else we got? Skills to Scale Complete Youth Baseball Training Manual. It's, uh, for those of us who join on an audiovisual platform, it's right there behind me. Um, the book is out. Um, it's everything we got. Uh, I had somebody add a question about um, something that Jeremy and I were talking about last pod about how to run um, practices and games in a way that like you can kind of build up arm workload and yada yada. And um, I sent that person um, a couple of resources to check out. But if you want the full story on how to do stuff like that, Skills at Scale, the Complete Youth Baseball Training Manual, it's right there. Um, it's got everything you need. It's a whole bunch of stuff all in one place. It's the book, and the book in and of itself, I think, is a pretty compelling uh, value prop. Heck, a lot cheaper than the next bat or the next tech device you might be buying for your child. Not to say that you shouldn't do those things. Uh, it's a heck of a lot cheaper than a year's worth of lessons. Uh, and it's going to give you all the tools you need, as whether you're running a youth team or whether you're coaching your own player, about how to understand this process of getting them better. Um, and it's going to help you demystify things uh, like the conversation that has um, got my hackles up a little bit this morning uh, about plyos, overload training, weighted balls, whatever you want to describe it. Um, if you want to demystify that stuff for yourself, if you want to understand why we do what we do, or for one, you could read the countless free blogs that we've written, you could read uh, the free training guides, you could get into the weeds in any number of different ways. They're not going to cost you one single cent because we want you to have that type of information. But if you want like the full meal deal, not only what we do, but why we do it, and then all the resources that go along with that, the drill videos, the practice plans, uh, the yearly training schedule, the micro schedule, the macro schedules. What do we mean micro macro schedules? Well, um, one of the things we have in there is what's called our YTP. It's our yearly training plan. And it's the way we break down an entire 12 months of training for our academy teams. That's the macro schedule. And the idea is, is that regardless of whether you live in Washington or in Arizona or on Mars, whenever your season starts, you can basically pick your start date and go through with guidance, this year-long approach to developing yourself to be better than you were the year before. So that's the macro schedule. The micro schedule are all the smaller phases, six-week blocks that work up into those uh, 52 weeks, sorry, my brain farted for a second, of what is kind of comprised of that entire overall calendar. Um, our bat-to-ball programs, our velocity development programs, our bat speed training programs, our competition blend programs, all of that stuff, it's all there in addition to our long-term athletic development, uh, exercise library, our dynamic warm-up library. Man, it's just, uh, you know, I, I've been I've been obsessed with trying to make youth baseball better for something pretty close to like 14 years now. And I try to put all of it in one book because I don't think it should take someone 14 years to be able to learn how to do this thing, as far as we can tell, the best way we know how. So in order to make that timeline shorter for you, we put all that stuff in one place. It's that book right there. So you could go check, go check it out. Um, what else we got? Youth Underload Smash Bat should be back in stock shortly. Uh, youth Power Training Bat should be in stock uh, and on sale before the end of this month. Uh, these are cost-effective 
and efficient training tools for you to be able to develop better hitters. Um, yeah, we're going to train with tech a lot because I think there's a lot of value to doing that. Um, but I also think that kids could generally be better served learning, learning how to hit by hitting. Um, are we going to work on some constraint positions and drills? Yes. Can you implement uh, a constraint implement like a youth underload smash bat into that environment in order to have a ton of success? Yes, it's 79 bucks. I think it's the best 79 bucks you can spend to help your kid be a better hitter. So you can go check that thing out. And the power bat is even more so that way. We should have more details on that soon. It should be uh, literally in my hands any day now. I'm very excited to see it because I haven't seen it since the prototyping phase. So I want to get my hands on the new toy that I built. Um, and that's all I got for you on housekeeping today. Unfortunately, I'm not joined uh, as per usual by my brother by choice, not my blood, my partner, my co-host, Driveline Academy Assistant Director, Driveline Academy International Man, Man of Mystery, my man, Fishy Grand, Jeremy Tectiel. Uh, Jeremy's down in Arizona with our Scottsdale location. Uh, I was just in Scottsdale. Uh, so he's going to be down there. So you guys got the solo pod today. So um, I don't have a ton of official agenda and uh, full caveat on display. Uh, your boy has not eaten enough today. Uh, I'm not at a very svelte weight. I have some pretty significant caloric needs in order to like be this size. Well, I mean this size. What am I talking about? I'm like 225 right now. I'm not even that big. Anyways, I haven't eaten anything uh, today. So this is going to be interesting to see how this goes. You're going to get the most unvarnished uh, and perhaps unhinged version of me that you've ever gotten. Um, and in the spirit of that... Uh, I thought it would be good for us to dive into some research. Um, I'm trying to think of how to frame this. Everything we do here is informed in one way, shape, or form by science, by technology, by research, by stuff that we could prove. And we're not trying to rely too much on anecdote or historically, you know, this just kind of like the stasis perspective, right? Well, this is just how we've always done it, right? Like, I think one of the things that I fell in love with about driveline when I stepped through the door is that the men and women that were here were intending to be disruptive. And I appreciate that. I appreciate people that are trying to disrupt. Um, maybe you don't. Uh, and I guess if you're on that side of the aisle, well, look, man, you're probably not even listening to this podcast. But if you, but if you literally are, um, I think it's a worthwhile thought exercise to just kind of consider when you are exposed to ideas or opinions or theories that are that differ from yours. This is the thing that I I find helpful for myself. Ask why. What is this person? What is their experience? What is their perspective that's motivated them to come to these particular conclusions? And look, man, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm the best at doing that all the time. Um, but I do try to hold myself to that standard because, you know, look, I go into this thing with the presumption that everybody's trying to do the, this thing to the best of their abilities. We want to develop baseball players. Like, that's, that's my job, you know, like... Uh, my job is to develop baseball players. That's that's what I do. I have taken the thing that I've learned for more than a decade on the field, working with recreational baseball players, uh, in addition to working with select and club baseball players, applied driveline system to this initiative of like, how do we create more competitive 90-foot baseball players? And we have referenced as much research, science, and rigorous study to come to the place that we are right now. Is it perfect? Eh, probably not. I, I mean, I, I guess from a scientific perspective, inherently nothing probably is. Um, and even if it were, there's going to be new technology, new insight that's going to change things. Um, you know, Jeremy and I talked at length about this idea of uh, inverse dynamics versus forward dynamics. I think the last podcast episode, you guys can heat check me on that. Um, and I just want to like double down on this idea that we're going to learn new things. And it's entirely possible that the new things that we learn might fundamentally shift and change what we're doing right now. And that's a good thing. That, that is a good thing. That destabilization of existing thought, the death of stasis, is a good thing. And I welcome it. Because it simply allows me to do my job better. 
Like that, that's the whole point. Um, which is different than wanting things to stay the same for no reason other than that is how they have always been. It makes me sad and certainly more than a little bit frustrated that there are a lot of people in our industry that gatekeep that way. I suppose the more cynical version of myself would say that they are gatekeeping in that regard solely because it allows them to maintain whatever hold of power, prestige, or influence that they have. But look, man, you guys know me. I don't want to be the glass half empty guy. I want to be the glass half full guy. Um, so with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about weighted balls. And my God, I, I don't really even... I understand the need for us to have this conversation because there's still a lot of misinformation out there. So I need to repress my own inner feelings of uh, reluctance to have this conversation for the nth time. And I truly mean the nth time. Um, so uh, there's a video that got posted by uh, my brother in arms, Michael O'Connell, AKA OC, driveline triple OG OC of uh, a video from the NFL combine. And they had some guys, uh, throwing a football fifth football is man i heat check me on this 15.4 ounces does that sound right i think that sounds right it's it's let's just say let's just say that it's close to a pound um football's close to a pound and somebody uh you know posted the video clip uh of yeah around 15 ounces uh 425 grams of guys the combine um ripping footballs into a, a mat, right? And there's somebody behind him with a stalker gun getting radar. Um, and OC, uh, probably much more adept at me at like putting information out like this without introducing my opinion, um, just posted the video and said, hey, you know, football weighs 15 ounces or 425 grams for the curious. Um, a lot of people start popping off. And I um, saw this and saw you know saw an opportunity to bring back an old old favorite of mine which is the sponge mob uh mocking text meme generator um so you know you get a bunch of like random capitalization and exclamation marks and all sorts of other stuff and i said but it's different um for those of us that have had these conversations about weighted balls online since like 2009 it is a little bit agonizing to continue to have the same conversation over and over and over because it feels like there's no there is new no there's no new soil to unearth right like we've we've beaten this proverbial horse to death we've turned it into a uh, horse glue if any of you have been around long enough uh, to remember Jeremy and I having that conversation on the pod um, but like it's but it's also obvious that a lot of people um, either haven't been involved in this conversation since 2009 or <laughs> haven't paid attention or haven't had their minds changed since 2009 or sometime prior to, which is, which is fine. Um, so, you know, I will cop to starting with a little bit of sarcasm because this conversation is a little bit exhausting, but like, let's look, it's just you and me here. Let's dig into this and let's talk about some new stuff um, that I actually read. Um, so the reason I said, but it's different uh, mocking SpongeBob text is because for as long as we've had this conversation about weighted balls in baseball, um, there have been some of us who have talked about the fact that people, and in my specific area of expertise, children throw heavier objects than the five ounce, nine inch circumference baseball and don't seem to run into the same. Um, scary amount of risk when it comes to uh, reconstructive UCL repair, you know, medial epicondylitis, your little league elbow, your little league shoulder, that type of stuff. And and ask some, what I think are some pretty valid questions as to why, right? Um, so let's, let's talk about what we understand. Uh, kinetics at the joint, as you increase ball weight, joint kinetics go down, meaning 
forces on the joints, okay? Um, and the way that the, the science has played out so far uh, generally is, well, you know, we've established that the, the UCL can has like an upper extremity limit of tolerance of, boy, I want to say it's like 54 or 64 newton meters of stress is basically like the tensile strength of the UCL. Um, the thought being there is that if you go above that, right, that if you uh, put an amount of stress on that ligament that is in excess of its of its actual capacitive strength, that that's where you run into the risk of you potential UCL issues. That's that's the science as we understand it. Um, and when those of us that are on the baseball side of things that believe that there is, you know, gold in the hills of overload, underload training in an age appropriate fashion, um, we'll bring up examples of kids throwing footballs and not having an extreme number of surgical interventions that come through that and start to ask some pretty basic questions like, well, why is that? Right? Um, so what's the difference between throwing a football and throwing uh, throwing a regular baseball? Uh, as far as I can tell, no one has done any like true A-B studies on kinetics and kinematics at like a one-to-one -one level uh, to compare the both, right? So we're, we're kind of like going what we understand about football versus what we understand about baseball. Probably a good study that we should run. I will just like make a note to myself and say we're going to do that. Um, but generally, the perspective that we have on this stuff is all these considerations about the quote-unquote differences in the way that the football is thrown, whether the need to make it spiral, whether we're talking about uh, amounts of horizontal shoulder abduction, a.k.a. scap retraction, whatever you want to call it, uh, that those differences are relatively minimal compared to the two most uh, the two most significant differences, which is as the ball weight really goes up drastically from five ounces, that the forces on the joint should be less than the forces that are when you're throwing a five ounce nine inch circumference baseball. So the conclusion that we come to to a degree is that throwing a football Well, I'm, actually, I'm not going to say safer. I'm just going to say that the kinetics at the joint level are less than they are when throwing a regular five-ounce baseball because of what we understand through the ASMI studies, Wake Forest studies, driveline studies, basically every marker-based motion capture inverse dynamic study revolves around this topic has come to that same flip and conclusion. Um, and because everybody is kind of like scientifically on the same page about how that works, I do feel sometimes a little bit exhausted by this conversation by people that don't take the time to read up on this type of stuff, but do take the time to have like a very specific opinion on it, which is, um, I don't know, I guess maybe that's just the nature of discourse year of our Lord 2024. Um, so then when I put that out there, sarcasm playing the sarcasm cob playing the sarcasm cod card uh mocking spongebob text generator user that i am um and people go like well you know oh you know you're you're just being sarcastic because you i don't know i don't want to have the other discussion it's like no we, we've had this discussion we've had this discussion over and over and over and over and it's all come to that same conclusion and like the other side of the aisle just doesn't want to read so What's the point? Um, the other reason that, it, it, that you know, the conclusion that I would draw from this of like why do football players not experience the same amount of, you know, UCL issues as baseball players is the volume of throwing, right? Um, now, I understand that maybe, you know, in like the seven-on-seven seven, um, world of things that maybe some of my my perspective on volume is inaccurate anymore um, because maybe some of these teams are throwing as frequently um, as your average 
12 U select baseball team that revolves around playing tournaments and not development. But but again, I, I'm not seeing uh, evidence of a drastic rise in UCL issues with youth football players, specifically quarterbacks. So if the more that these kids are playing games because of the broad professionalization of youth sport, but you're not seeing a correlation to a drastic rise in UCL injuries, then that brings me back to point number one, which is as ball weight goes up, kinetics at the joint go down. Da da da, science. Hey, everybody's happy about science. Um, but like everybody's not happy about science um, because I think people just want to. Some people, some people. Some people just want to kind of like be couched in this fear of weighted balls um, and they don't want to be shifted out of that perspective. And I guess if that's if that's the boat that they want to stay in, who am I to who am I to judge? Right. Um, let he who has not read um, a peer reviewed study on on weighted ball research cast the first stone, I, I guess is the point that we're coming to. Um, but let's talk about a little bit of an interesting some, some new information. And this is something I think we talked a little bit about last week but it does i think pertain to this to this other kind of like question about weighted balls which is well when is it appropriate for children right so let's say i've read all the research i've read um i've read all the research and i agree that weighted balls when used with a healthy um adult population shouldn't be an inordinate amount of risk. Hey, Devin, I agree, but what about kids? Okay, let's talk about kids. Um, and I want to talk about this thing called Davis's Law. So uh, this is from, uh, and actually an article posted by, uh, I believe, uh, Randy Sullivan, uh, Florida Baseball Armory, um, one of the OGs in our sport, OGs in baseball development. Um, and he has a great blog about the, the question, I believe, if I remember correctly in the blog was, well, do I shut it down or I, do I keep going in the off season, right? And, and trying to kind of get at something that we've poked a little bit of hole in um, on the pod here. Do I need to shut it down for two, three months, right? Um, and Randy, if I remember correctly in the blog, was kind of writing from this perspective of talking to an MLB org and saying like, hey... Um, what are you going to do with these guys who are struggling to maintain um, a viable, they're struggling to, to continue to be an asset in your organization. What are you going to do with them? Um, well, you know, we, we got to shut them down at the end of the year. And it was like, well, but, but do you, sorry, with me only to talk here, I, I might have to take a water break every once in a while. Um, so Randy in this blog kind of talks about this question of like, should you shut down? And, and to preface this, first of all, um, the first thing that he starts with is, is pretty basic, right? Um, and it goes, I'll, I'll just read from it. If you're a stud who is throwing three to five miles an hour harder than your competitive peer group, and I think that applies to, to youth baseball, we can think about those kids. Um, your command of all your pitches is 15% better than your competitive peer group. Um, Sure. Yeah. Like, okay. I, I, I can think of a, a youth athlete that that looks like. Um, your secondary stuff is 15% better than your competitive peer group. <coughs> uh, that one might be a challenge because it does, it does kind of call into question. How do you determine that? Right. And we've talked about that a lot on the pod. You know, we're talking about effective secondary stuff because of actual shape and pitch spin characteristics. Are we talking about just how it plays for youth hitters that just aren't very good? Um, but fine. We'll, we'll just note that caveat there. Um, and he says, uh, and you've already thrown a ton of innings this year. Then shutting down probably seems like a good idea. Okay. I think we can paint the picture of what a youth athlete looks like using that characteristic, that, that kind of composition and come to a, a pretty well-informed decision about who should or should not shut down. Um, and I think that that totally makes sense. I will also punt, not punt. I will also uh, pivot to say that youth athletes 
might want to take some amount of shutdown time, period. Why am I saying that? Because of everything I know about the domain-specific repetitive stress injuries in youth baseball players. I'm not talking about full-blown UCL repairs. I'm talking about, again, the medial epicondylitis. Um, I can't even remember like the medical name for, uh, for youth little league shoulder, but again, it's another epicondylitis, if I remember correctly. We're talking about repetitive stress. Um, that's something that I think it makes sense broadly for kids to take time off. And again, like, look, Randy Sullivan is not writing this from the perspective of, hey, what suits the average 12 year old? He's telling you what he's, what he's talking about, right? He's talking about working with professional prospects, tomato, potato. These two things are not the same. I get it. But to substantiate this idea of why it might make sense for some of these guys to not take time off, Randy does go into this idea of what's called Davis's law. And uh, this is this is pertinent to this conversation about weighted balls, right? Um, Davis's law is used in anatomy and physiology to describe how soft tissue models, uh, models along imposed demands. Uh, let me go back to my other thing. Um, According to Davis's law, all human tissue adapts and aligns in response to the stresses to which it is exposed, including why the introdu introduction of stress can be a positive. So we've talked about this a lot, right? And if you really want to go deep into the weeds uh, of some of the weighted ball research, if I remember correctly, and again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, I'm just an idiot that's read a lot of this stuff or has been around smart people who've either written it or read it or wrote it, um, you might see peak stress at one moment of the throw actually go up with weighted balls, but total stress is still less than re throwing a regular five ounce baseball. Uh, Eric Kozak and I, when we did our proven wrong episode of the podcast, if you haven't listened to that one and you want to um, listen to kind of, again, how we at driveline slash we in the Academy think about these type of questions. Uh, that's a good episode that you should listen to. Um, but the thought here is that you don't want to avoid stress. You want to condition yourself for it. So, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. The microscopic trauma to tendons, ligaments, and muscles is a necessary phase to go through so that the body can repair the damage by specialized cells that float around in the bloodstream with no responsibility until they sense damage to another cell. And I realize this is just like an incredibly complicated point to unpack in youth baseball. And again, if I haven't expressed my appreciation for audi our audience enough, let me double down at this specific and particular moment. Those of us that are actually trying to get in the weeds to really, really understand this stuff at a really fine level, I think are a very limited amount of people. You are like a 1% of the 1%. If you're someone that's actively involved in youth baseball that's trying to get into this level of the weeds uh, when it comes to understanding this topic, um, I don't wish uh, John the Baptist's fate on you, but I do appreciate those of you that John the Baptist this idea out into the public to try to talk about these things from an informed perspective and help to educate people who just don't know enough. Um, because at the end of the day, I think the things that I keep coming back to is both of these ideas. Number one, total kinetics at the joint level are lessened as ball weight goes up. I don't believe that there's infinite runway for that, right? Um, you know, you, you guys that again, who are longtime listeners have heard us, um, you know, go on and on and on about, uh, some studies on weighted balls that I think were just programmed in a way where getting kids hurt was almost like a foregone conclusion. What were the big issues with those studies? Uh, basically two things. One, uh, inadequate amount of onboarding time. What would be the result of a more adequate onboarding? You would have more time to help kids progressively get acclimated to stress, right? That would be the point of that. You want to give them time 
to engage in this aspects of Davis's law relative to tissue repair and adaptation that comes from stress. It's not that stress is a bad thing and you should avoid it. It's that stress is actually a good thing. You just need the time and structure to acclimate to it appropriately. So that's part of it. Uh, the other part of it is that you can't... Uh, I'm trying to think of like what's, what's the best way to kind of make this make sense in plain terms. There's no mechanical panacea where you're going to be able to throw at any type of competitive velocity. And that is very much relative to age, relative to physiology, relative to competition level, and not experience stress from throwing. There's no magic mechanics that are going to allow that to happen. Because as far as we can tell, with the information that we have, stress is a non-negotiable part of the activity of throwing. If that's true, then I think there's just two things you need to take action from that. One, again, is be progressive in the way that you increase that amount of stress when you're in an onboarding phase, building up, right? Two is maintaining that through activity and intensity over time. And like I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to myself talk about this, and I just feel like this is just getting way too technical. But well, number one, it's a podcast, and and I, I don't know. I hope that some of you like actually want to listen to this from like an incredibly informed technical perspective, because it's you're going to go out into your communities, you're with your players and your teams, and you're going to help them get better because you've taken the time to learn. Kudos to you. I, I'm just going to keep saying it. Two. Um, is that I think we do have to demystify this type of stuff at scale to help coaches understand things better. Um, And this simple question of like, well, if you can throw a football with like a decent amount of frequency and it's drastically different than throwing a regular baseball and not tend to experience the same type of injury risk why is that? These are good questions for us to ask. Um, and when the answer that I hear on the other side about somehow suggesting that all of the criticisms of weighted ball training are bad and they aren't broadly invalidated by the, the actual scientific reality of joint kinetics and the anecdotal reality of not seeing this huge increase of of young football players that have UCL injuries, it's like, well, it's just different. And at that point, look, man, I'm just I'm just going to be sarcastic and you're going to get the mocking SpongeBob text generator. Because you, you're burning enough calories to take in a, an opinion on something, but your opinion is colossally uninformed, not even just by science, but just like by your own anecdotal experience right? By all of our anecdotal experience. We don't see a giant population of youth football players that have UCL repairs. There's no domain-specific repetitive stress injury classification for shoulder and elbow issues of kids that are throwing footballs all the time. There is for baseball. Why is that? Because the five-ounce, nine-inch circumference baseball was not decreed by God on high to be the only safe implement that your child should ever throw, straight up. Oh, man. Was this a bummer of a beginning to the pod to, like, beat this dead horse into horse glue yet again? I hope not. Um, Let's talk about some more fun stuff because I don't want to talk about weighted balls anymore. Um, So I finally watched Whiplash the other night. And for those of you that heard us get very hippy-dippy on the last pod talking about love and fear and failure and fulfillment, hopefully this is up your alley. Um... So for anybody that hasn't seen Whiplash, it's a story of a music teacher, professor uh, at a very like in-demand music school in New York uh, and a student who wants to be great at the drums. And this teacher um, is incredibly manipulative in the way that he teaches and it's everything like 
that guy did not go through a positive coaching alliance uh, coaching course. Very clearly, very clearly. Uh, J.K. Simmons plays him uh, perfectly well. Uh, he seems completely despicable, almost inhuman in different parts uh, of the movie because of how profoundly terrible he treats uh, these kids. Um, but I think there's some interesting stuff, I think, from both sides in that movie that that apply to youth baseball. And maybe this is just me being obsessive about youth baseball and seeing it in almost every aspect of life. Maybe it's valid. I don't know. You tell me. Um, so the the main character of the story, the, the drumming student, um, at one point is sitting down and he's watching a movie with his dad. And his dad is kind of inquiring how things are going uh, at the school, has, you know, has this really famous teacher taken notice of him? You know, is he going to get a shot to be a core member of their, their jazz ensemble? Um, and it sounds like, you know, he basically tells his dad, it's like, hey, you know, it's not going particularly well right now, um, et cetera, et cetera. And his dad is like, well, you know, it's, it's okay, man. Like, it's, it's all right. It, you know, might, might not be that thing. You just, you know, do the best you can. And, you know, and he's like, it's all right. And he's like, well, this is the perspective that I have as a father. You know, like you get to be my age and you have this type of perspective. And, uh, and the kid, Andrew, Andrew, I think I have that right. And I'm not going to take the time to Google it. So I'm just going to go with the fact that I think I have it right in Andrew. Andrew says to his dad, he says, I don't want perspective. And it made me think of all the kids that I know who desperately want to be good at this game and how we serve those type of kids appropriately. Because I think some of them, because they're so driven, they are Andrew in Whiplash. They don't want perspective. They want to be great. And look, I'm, I'm aware that uh, it's an unreasonable expectation for, like, broadly, children 9 to ages 12 to be able to, like, land on that thing. I think that's that's kind of silly. I think all of us would broadly agree that, uh, you know, a well-rounded childhood is one where kids are exposed to a multitude of stimulus and sports and art and education, etc. And they get a chance to, like, find their path. Um But sometimes you run into a kid that wants to be great. And, and that's a different thing, right? Um, and that kid might not want perspective. Doesn't mean they don't need it. And it doesn't mean that there isn't value in a parent or ideally a teacher to be able to provide context. Talked about this ad nauseum. Thank you guys for indulging me in the fact that I have a very limited number of like original ideas in my head and I just regurgitate the same ones over and over. Um, but when I was listening to, or I was watching Andrew sit down and, and tell his dad, um, I don't want perspective. It made me think about young ball players that want to be great and what that looks like in, in 2024. Um, you know, like I had somebody pop off on our Instagram and, and say something that very pithy, uh, about something that we posted hit hit me with like a couple clown emojis and it's like fine like i i recognize that that's like the internet version uh, of like the big middle finger to you and like um you got one off you, you got a comment off before you get blocked and then the comment gets deleted so like kudos to you uh if you think you're really gonna like disturb my mode from uh from that little interaction uh i got news for you it ain't that deep um, and like, it's just such a loser mentality to like pop off that way. You know, the old adage that someone, anyone that's going to like pop off that way, it, it's never someone that's doing better than you. It's, is very applicable anyways. But I think about a kid that wants to be great now and what information intake looks like, because they're going to get it from all different avenues um they've got an explore page on instagram just like we do and like man i'm so i'm so thankful i'm so i'm so thankful that uh when my son 
see stuff like that that he sends it to me. And we can have conversations about it. And we can talk about it. Because, you know, the reality is, is that everybody is getting inundated with information. And children, when they're trying to evaluate, like, who's right and who's wrong, shoot, obviously, I mean, we just spent the first half of this podcast talking about how adults probably don't do the best job of that. Kids certainly aren't going to have that same capacity. So um, it's understandable, you know, when, when kids are just like, they, they want to find the fix, you know, like, and I've, I've worked with those type of kids. I've had them in our programs. I've, I've had them um, on teams and they're like, they're incessant about like trying to find like the right fix for them. And it's like, well, I, maybe this drill is going to do it, or maybe this constraint position is going to do it. And, you know, in the last like couple of weeks, there've been some pretty hilarious videos about like, uh, you know, hitting drills in 2024, catching drills in 2024 and making fun of, uh, throwing drills in 2024. And, um, I mean, the funny thing is, like a lot of that stuff, those guys have a better understanding of constraints, of the constraint-led approach, than a lot of like the boomers who, <laughs> who like the moment you put a kid in a constraint position, they're like, well, that's not how you hit, right? They just don't fundamentally understand it. So even in mocking that stuff, I think a lot of those guys are actually more informed than than some of the some of the, the old heads. And like, I mean, who who am I? You know, I'm going to be 47 this year. I suppose I'm an old head myself, but I'm an old head that like tries to at least be as informed as best as I can. But I just, I, I'm really empathetic with this, you know, kids who, who want to be great and, and have the fortune slash misfortune of being a child who like finds their thing early, you know, like that's a, it can be dangerous because you could have a child who doesn't want perspective but they're also still learning. So how, how do you serve that kid? Look, the thing in Whiplash is that it's, it's music and it's subjective. You know, like a lot of the worst behavior that uh, Fletcher, the teacher in um, Whiplash have, has to revolve all around like, are you on time? Are you on my tempo? You're not on my tempo, he says all the time. Um, In jazz, in that environment, in a music school, you can't quantify that. But you know what can is like Pro Tools and Logic. Those are like uh, computer programs where you can make music. Um, and I don't know, maybe that just speaks to the way that technology is changing everything. Because it is. Because it gives us clear and unbiased insight into are you performing the task or not and how do you perform the task not through my subjective experience not through my expert eyes opinion and ears in the case of whiplash but like are you actually on time and if you're not on time how much are you off time by i mean look in whiplash the beginning of it is like he's having a hard time hitting like the double time shuffle or whatever. I was more of like a Bernard Purdy, Jeff Picaro, um, rush guy, but, um, you know, they spent a lot of time talking about, you know, jazz drummers. So that's fine. Um, if he was training with data shoot, I mean, even guitar hero, right? Like even rock band, those games would tell you if you're on time and you could literally get like measured and scored about how on time and how accurate you are at hitting the notes you're supposed to hit. And I just truly believe that like, there's a, there's a better way to, to use technology and integrate it with humanity to be able to get insight into into whether you're doing the thing the way that you want it or not. That's a baseball thing. That's a music thing. It's an anything thing. If you're open to the perspective of figuring out how you make technology work for you. A lot of people aren't, and I get that. But, like, I also think in 20 years you're not going to have a choice. In, in five, you might not have a choice. But I thought the... I thought the, uh, the the writing of that movie was... I mean, it's obviously... It's it's one of the best movies in the last 20 years. By some people's account, it's one of the best movies of all time. Um, 
the writing in that section was just like so well done because when I heard Andrew go, I don't want perspective, it immediately reminded me of all the interactions I've had with young kids that want to be great in this game and are very uncompromising in how they want to get there. So like, yeah, you know, again, I can recognize that the, uh, that the average preteen child is, is best served through a cornucopia of experience and variation. And maybe some, and I think some of those kids are going to be great, like straight up. I, I think, you know, obviously we've talked at length uh, about the need for keeping kids playing baseball. And I think it's fair and reasonable for those type of kids to have a pathway to discover at 12, 13, 14, 15, maybe even 16, hey, I actually, I want to be great at this thing. And let's give them the unvarnished truth about what greatness actually looks like and help put them on the path to get there. For sure. We're, we're doing that 365 days a year at the Triathlon Academy. I think you also have the other thing too. And it, I think it was just very poignant to to watch that movie and hear that line and, and be intimately reminded of like that perspective exists as well. And I think that connects to another thing. So later in the movie, and I don't want to spoil it for anybody um, that hasn't seen it. It came out like 2014, I think. So you've had like a decade. Um, and I can't tell you how long you should fast forward on this pod where I'm going to stop talking about this movie. So I'm going to try to describe this in a way that won't ruin anything. At some point in the movie, uh, Andrew, the student, and Fletcher, the teacher, sit down and have a drink. And they're talking about the uncompromising way that Fletcher taught and interacted with all of his students. And he goes on this um, a monologue about, you know, pretty good being the worst possible thing uh, that you could say to a child. I think he describes as like one of the worst, you know, worst two words in the human language. I don't remember the line. You guys could go back and watch the movie and he checked me. But he's talking about this idea that that basically revolves around giving like tacit approval to mediocre performance does legitimate disservice to the person that's on the receiving end of it because they're not getting the God's honest truth about how good or bad that they actually are. And Fletcher is kind of like patting himself on the back for being the one person who is bold enough to kind of like hold that line. And he's talking about uh, Charlie Parker, the bird. And the story that they tell in Whiplash several times is how Charlie Parker um, was in an audition or playing, and I, I'm not a huge jazz guy, so I'm, I'm probably getting some of this wrong. And he played a note wrong, and uh, the band leader or conductor or whatever uh, threw a cymbal at him. And not like... Well, first of all, think about drum cymbals, right? Um, but second of all, like literally like huck the thing at him. And Charlie Parker was was embarrassed and sad, but because he got this um, unvarnished feedback on the quality of his performance, that it compelled him to practice. And Fletcher's point is basically that that, that incident is what is the genesis of what became the bird. One of the best, you know, best musicians, best artists in the 20th century. And Andrew, the student, comes back and says, well, isn't it possible that it could have discouraged him too? And Fletcher's reply, Fletcher's reply is, Charlie Parker would never be discouraged. And I thought that was interesting. Because effectively what he's saying is these type of rare geniuses, these savants, these people that are driven in a way that normal people are not, can't be discouraged. And it doesn't matter if you throw a symbol at them. 
and it doesn't matter if you are manipulative to them emotionally, it doesn't matter if you are verbally and physically abusive to them, that all of those things serve a goal. And that goal is to extract the most out of that particular artist and to drive them with clear, unvarnished feedback about the lack of quality of their efforts as they're developing them that you that you have to it's your job it's your duty as a teacher to give that to them um and it made me think a lot about coaches in baseball who i think see it that same way and they see their directness towards these kids as like it serves it serves the goal and the goal is build the best baseball player you can and if in service of that goal I hurt your feelings and I make you feel bad about what you've produced then all I'm trying to do is like separate the wheat from the chaff. And I am trying to exercise the kids who don't want to be great away from those that do. Because Charlie Parker would never be discouraged. And then if you are that driven to be the best you can be, then again, it is my job as coach or teacher to, to be unflinchingly honest. Now, okay, look, this is where my analogy starts to break down, right? Because I think there's a fine line between unflinchingly honest and physically and verbally abusive. Um, I think there's a line between giving someone clear feedback about whether they achieved the task or not um, and doing so in a way that like does discourage them and for me all this just comes back to is data um, I think it just comes back to data in a perspective that you can have in a conversation you can have that fundamentally shifts the landscape from what is exemplified in whiplash Right, what Whiplash, you know, what Fletcher advocates for in Whiplash is just like, if I can't, if I can't terrorize you to what to whatever degree that means, then I'm not able to do my job at the at the at the level that I want to do it. And you know, at one point in this conversation he has with with Andrew, he's like, you know, at least at least I tried. You know, God damn it, I I tried. And he's like patting himself on the back for being physically abusive, being emotionally manipulative for having a kid, having kids really internalize with a pretty great degree of self-hatred, their failings. And this to me, I think just comes back to the role of data in training and how it acts as kind of like this disinterested third party. Um, and I think, you know, we've, we've talked a lot uh, and we'll continue to talk a lot about how data can be used to drive engagement and gamification and kind of the sense of accomplishment. I think also data can tell you the truth that you might suck right now. And you know, we've also had this conversation on this podcast about data feeling like prescriptive that way. But it's, again, it's only prescriptive, prescriptive in that specific fashion if you only get that data once. Because the moment that you increase the quantity and the frequency with which you compile that data, if you are practicing, if you are trying to get better, if you are driven, it's going to show improvement. So to me, when when I saw 
when I was watching that movie and I saw Fletcher give that quote and say the next Charlie Parker would never be discouraged. I think, I think that perspective is rooted in just like one way of getting better. And there's another way. And I, again, I don't think I'm treading any new ground. I'm a man of very limited new ideas. So this is just me once on here, once again on here, pontificating about how ultimately, if you're in the business of developing youth baseball players, that kid is just developing against themselves. They are in their own journey, in their own quest to be better than they were the day before. The more that you can quantify that, and I think the more that you can communicate just the truth of where you are in that process, the better that you can serve the athlete while you mitigate the chances that they do become discouraged. Because, you know, like, look, I, I believe that, you know, human beings are inherently into adaptable to the stimulus that they've been given. Um, but I think there's a bunch of different pathways there, man. You know, like, uh, you know, uh, Thor, the Game of Thrones guy, just went up and pulled like a uh, thousand pounds at the Arnold Classic uh, this weekend. Pulled it about the same way as that, like, I'm going to pick up this laptop from the stand um, when we're done here. Just completely eye opening. But, like, Eddie Hall deadlifted 1,000 pounds, too. And Eddie Hall and Half Thor, biologically very different. Eddie Hall was a swimmer. He was, like, a tiny dude. Half Thor also wasn't, like, the biggest guy. He was a basketball player, but, like, he was still tall. Eddie's, like, a squat little guy. Pulled 1,000 pounds. Did it with blood seeping out of his nose, so that's pretty tight. But he did it. And when it comes to teachers, and you can substitute coach or parent for teacher in this specific regard, when I, when I hear that perspective that's advocated for by Fletcher and Whiplash, that like, hey, I should just be given carte blanche to be as negative and as evil as I can be in search of unearthing the next great athlete I think of how couched in ignorance that whole perspective is because it acts as though there's only one way to get there. When I think about baseball players that have gotten that way, you know, I, I think about like the George Bretts of the world, right? Guys who had these toxic, poisonous relationship with their parents who even having reached like the absolute summit, the absolute mountaintop, still had like this negativity loop with the the people of, of great influence in their lives. You know, like the Mutt Mickey Mantle story is just about as bad. I'm sure that there's some others that I'm forgetting. And you know, maybe this is just anecdote. Maybe this is just like something I'm trying to tell myself. But I, I believe the other thing is possible. I believe the other thing is possible wherein you can leverage data and to whatever degree data means either in baseball or some other field, you can leverage unbiased qualitative and quantitative feedback on your performance and use that to improve yourself. I think that's a thing. And I think if you combine that with the opposite of throwing a symbol at Charlie Parker's head. I think if you combine that with as much love and encouragement as you possibly can be to fill these kids' cups, to fill their emotional gas tanks, I think you also can get close to the truth of how good they can possibly be. And even if I'm wrong, I would rather be wrong this way. 
I would rather be wrong as a coach or a parent and feel confident that I tried to give these kids as much love as I possibly could, as much encouragement as I possibly could, leverage the data to give them the unbiased truth about how good they are becoming, and be at peace with the outcome. I would much rather be on that side of it. Uh, you know, and I, I I recognize that like the counter argument to this is is a tough position to take, right? Like, well, well, why why can't I just like abuse kids? Like, why why can't I? The, nobody's really taking that position. But it's not necessarily that; it's the other thing. It's the emotional meat grinder of putting a child in the bloopity blue international championship every single weekend. It's Posting, we won the whoop the wa memorial, yada, yada, whoever tournament. You post the first place stuff, but you don't post them when they were fourth. You don't post them when you were eighth. Do you think the kids don't infer the difference? Do you think that they are obtuse? To the way that you celebrate them when they win, but you don't when they lose? Do you think that they're immune to those signals? Because I'm pretty sure that they're not. And I'm pretty sure what you're constructing is like a literal house of cards that effectively says, I love you when you win and I don't when you don't. You want to raise your kids like that? Fine. You want to run your program like that? Fine. But like I, you know, I had a parent uh, reached out, was with our org for a while, left, went to another place that like, I don't have a program in there. I don't have a kid in their program. I don't have any direct firsthand knowledge of how they run their program, but I've heard things. And when that parent talks to one of the parents of a guy in our program, and he goes, yeah, you know, Johnny, Katie, Billy, whatever, kids having, like, anxiety attacks over baseball. Hey, the real Charlie Parker would never be discouraged. If I have to... Uh, if I have to terrorize these kids, if I have to man emotionally manipulate them, if I have to impart a feeling that they are only valued and loved and worthwhile if they are winning, in the game of baseball, in everything that that portends, hey, if I get one Charlie Parker out of the group, that's fine. Sure, that's fine. And it's hard for me to not see this as a natural byproduct of a perspective about youth baseball that only values one side of the equation. And until the day comes that a better coach than me tells me that all this stuff is really, really valuable, that they are evaluating kids as the competitive level increases by these type of metrics, more so than they are, what does your skill composition look like? The day that that changes is the day that I will change. Uh, and I'm still waiting. And like, look, you know, it's it's high school baseball tryouts, you know, have concluded. We're, we are in Washington. Um, I was very proud of my boy for making a team. And we talked openly and honestly about like, hey, man, there's no downside here. If you make a varsity team, great, good job. Understand that like you're going to be a young on a varsity, a young kid on a varsity team, and like the game should not rest on your shoulders. You have a lot to learn. You have a lot to learn. You got to learn how to act. You got to learn how to play the game, and you kind of probably need to do both at those same times. Um, talked about hey, you make a JV team, great, good, have fun. You get a chance to kind of like slow slow roll your way into learning how to play competitive high school ninety foot baseball. It's great. 
You get cut. Okay, great. We just got to keep working. It's a great signal to have. It's great signal to be cut. I got to get better. That's the signal. And, you know, uh, because I coached so long in my local neighborhood where my kids have grown up, um, I know a lot of these kids that are trying out with my son. Um, and I think the one that hurt my heart the most was a kid that was on his last all-star team that I got. I only got a chance to coach her for one year. Kid could hit, he could bang. Putting balls over little league fences, the whole deal. Not with, you know, U-trip uh, perverted bats, but like, you know, the, the dead wood USA baseball bats. Um, kid could bang. And um, was a very good 12-year-old baseball player. Got cut as a, as a freshman in high school. And it kills me because I think that kid wanted to be good. I don't know if he was like driven, driven. I don't know if he was going to be Charlie Parker. But I do think with a different expenditure of time, choice, schedule, etc. During the period of like 12 through 15, I think we could have gotten that kid at least a chance to just make a team. And then from there, who knows where it goes. I think we get a chance to play baseball when you're a little bit older. It, again, it just has the ability to cover, to, to cover. I think when you play baseball as a little bit of an older kid, it has an opportunity to positively color your perspective on life. I didn't even play that long at 90 foot baseball, and I think it did that for me. So I want that. I, I want our game to be able to provide that for kids. And when I see stuff like this, when I see a 12-year-old kid who had all all the tools were there. It wasn't just a cage swing, right? Kid kid could bang in competition. Kid could play. When you see those tools on display at 12, you see a kid get cut at 15. Sucks, man. Really sucks. So, I don't know. It's worth worth considering. Um because I think you're going to have both. You know, you're going to have those kids who are very, very driven, and you have other kids who just want to like play it because it's fun. I want to keep both of those kids playing baseball for as long as possible. And if you are one of those coaches who has moments where you talk yourself into this type of behavior, and the explanation you give is tantamount to Charlie Parker would never be discouraged. I would strongly suggest to you that there is a different way. And to whatever degree you have talked yourself into the validity of this negative, consequential, manipulative environment of being the only way that you can extract greatness from kids, there's another way. I think you can fill up their emotional gas tanks with love and support and nurture that ambition that they have and look you do that one of two things are going to happen they're going to get what they want and they're going to get that thing or they're not but they're going to feel loved and i ultimately think that that kid that is filled with love and support uh in whatever it is that they're trying to endeavor uh is much more likely to have a positive relationship with the activity later on in life that's it I think they have a much more likely uh, chance of extracting something of value than a wall full of trophies that mean nothing to no one. Most specifically, the athlete that earned them. I don't know. That's all I got for you today. Uh, two weeks back to back, getting pretty hippy dippy. Uh, it's near four o'clock. Your boy has not eaten anything yet, so I apologize for the. Uh, obtuse rambling if that's what this has devolved into um next time i will be with a guest of some comport or another um next time i hope to have my power bat 
on hand here. Uh, we're going to talk about all the research and science that we use from our bat fending database, uh, leveraging all this data that we had on moment of inertia, aka swing weight, to construct a single bat speed training system that I really truly believe is going to be beneficial for kids like 10 all the way up to 14, including those 14 year olds who aren't ready for BB core yet because I want those kids to have a path to continue to play this game. So we built a tool for them in addition to the other young kids who just want to move the bat faster because moving the bat fast is good. Um, that's about all I got for all you guys that went out and made a high school baseball team. Congratulations. Listen to your high school coach. That person much more likely has a ton of experience you're trying to impart to you. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Hopefully they're going to be receptive to them. Hopefully you don't have a, a Fletcher-esque teacher from Whiplash. Uh, hopefully you have the other thing. But, uh, man, for all you guys that went out and made a high school baseball team, congratulations. For you guys who are starting up your Little League seasons, um, go have fun. Go, go have fun. And if, if you got cut from a club team or from a high school team, understand that you're just you're in a competition with yourself and you got some feedback right now that you got some stuff to improve and i understand that 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 cuts close i understand that that hurts to get that feedback but like appreciate the opportunity that's giving you too because now you have an opportunity to prove them wrong now you have an, you now you have an opportunity to show them that you won't be determined or discouraged by getting this feedback and you're actually going to receive it and take action from it. It's going to help you right now in getting the closest as you can in your baseball career to seeing how good you can be. That perspective is going to help you as a parent, as an employee, as a student, as a parent. Like it, It's going to help you holistically. It hurts to get that feedback sometimes. I get it. I I get it. I have emotional reactions to getting that feedback because I certainly screw stuff up all the time. The more adept that I am as an older person about taking that feedback and responding to it and trying to figure out how I can do different things differently, I think the closer that I am to rev to uncovering the best version of myself that I can be. And like that's that's the game game that I think that this whole thing revolves around. Man, I'm I'm getting really spacey on you guys. I should probably wrap it up. It is 4:01 p.m. on Monday, March 4th. I hope you guys have a great day, a great evening, a great week. Uh, I hope you will catch us next time on the Driveline Academy podcast, the world's most dangerous youth baseball podcast. The only podcast in the world that's going to have these type of long-winded ramblings about uh, Davis's law and uh, movies because that's a thing that we do. Uh, skills is Skill Complete Baseball Training Manual is out. Go get it if you haven't. Youth Under Low Smash Bats are out. Go get them if you haven't. Power Bat is coming soon. Go get it when it's out. Uh, free stuff is out there. Go to drivelinebaseball.com. Free resources, free practice plans, uh, free team training programs, free individual training programs. Uh, I don't know what are the other stuff I have to plug. Um, oh, axbat.com, code DL20, uh, Dingus Loser 20 Get yourself 20% off of bats. And all the other toys that they have at axpat.com. And if you can take the 30 seconds it would take to like, review, subscribe, uh, any of the places that you're engaging with the podcast, it's hugely appreciated. Uh, thank you guys so much for spreading this thing out there. Hey, man, we broke 100,000 listens. I, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the coaches out there that are trying to do this thing in what I would say is the right way. And that doesn't mean the driveline way. If you never throw an overload ball in your life, but you want kids to love this game, hey, man, I, I appreciate you for doing what you're doing. And I hope you have a great season. I'll catch you guys next time. Take it easy.